Hey everybody, welcome back to World History. We're talking about the late medieval period, and especially England and France. We're going to take a look at what was happening internally for both of these countries. The English had a few great leaders before 1066, like Alfred the Great and Edward the Confessor. However, Edward the Confessor died in 1066, and he had kind of pseudo-promised the throne to a couple of people. There were three who felt like they had a rightful claim to be the next monarch. One of them was a cousin of his, Harold, who was a Viking from Norway. Another was Harold, King Edward's own son-in-law. And another was one of Edward's cousins from France, Duke William of Normandy. So all three of these guys, as soon as Edward the Confessor died, all three of those guys, Harold, Harold, and William, claimed that they should be the rightful next monarch. Harold, his son-in-law, living in England, had the advantage of home ground. And so after Edward died, Harold, the Englishman, was the first one to know about it and also put together an army to defend himself from the invaders who were going to come to claim the throne. First, he had to fight off his other Harold, the Viking. Harold the Viking came over with a large army, and Harold the Englishman was able to defeat them in northern England. But just as soon as the battle was over, Harold the Englishman discovered that William of Normandy in France had sailed across and was invading southern England. So Harold had to take his army from the north, march them all the way south after just winning a battle, and then fight another battle. This other battle he fought at a place called Hastings. And it's one of the most famous moments in history, if you really, really like English history. The Battle of Hastings in 1066, and it's the Norman invasion of England. William was an interesting guy. William's dad was the Duke of Normandy, but William's mom was not the wife of the Duke of Normandy. The mom was a servant girl, and William recognized um, his, his dad was also William, the Duke. So uh, older William recognized his son, younger William, even though it wasn't from his wife, from his marriage, he recognized William as a legit kid of his, and he ended up being the strongest one. And so he took over as the Duke of Normandy after his dad died. And this William of Normandy invaded and beat Harold at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, hugely successful, and then conquered all of England. All of the resistance against him was killed. So William the Bastard, as he was known, became William the Conqueror of all England. And he declared all of England his own personal property, just like any medieval lord would do. And then he cut up England into dukedoms, or duchies, and gave them to some of his Norman or Northern French uh, assistants, some of his vassals, other parts of England were given to Englishmen who had been loyal to him instead of to Harold, of uh, the son-in-law of the old Edward the Confessor. This new king, William, has a census taken, and this census is so that he can know how much to charge all of the people in England. This census was compiled as a complete population of England, anybody who was rich enough to need to pay taxes, anybody who owned land, and how much land, and where it was. And this book was famous. It was called the Doomsday Book. He gave his French lords about 80% of England to run as his vassals. Remember, a vassal is somebody underneath a higher level of lord or a king. He died, and, and the kingdom went to his son, William II. He was nicknamed William Rufus, which means redhead, ginger. And so William Rufus was uh, the second king, the second Norman king, uh, but he was very, very unpopular. It's said that maybe he was possessed by the devil. He was so uncool. People hated him. He was mean and brutal and nasty, according to the legends. 
and when he died, he died on a hunting trip with his younger brother. Uh, I think his younger brother was Henry, Henry I. And uh, it didn't really take a genius to figure out that maybe the younger brother killed the older brother in order to claim the throne from his older brother, William II. And uh, by the time William II's body had come out of the woods and was being taken to the nearest town, his younger brother, who was on the hunting trip with him, had already gone around telling everyone he was the new king. Interestingly, um, William II, William Rufus, was so unpopular for being brutal and nasty that no church, well, almost no church in England was willing to take his dead body and bury it. Uh, it was holy ground and... If he was possessed by the devil, no one wanted that body in their holy ground, except for one little church. There was one little church that was willing to accept his body. So he was given a funeral there. He was buried there. And by the end of that year, that church was struck by lightning and had burned to the ground. So maybe he was not on God's nice list. Okay. <clears throat> one of Henry I's descendants was Henry II. Henry II added to his English lands and his Norman lands by marrying Eleanor of Aquitaine. We already met her before. She was the daughter of a French duke, the wife of a French king, but he hadn't given her any kids after 10 years of marriage, so she bailed on him and uh, married the king of England. Henry decided to send his royal legal experts all around the country in a traveling um, court so that they could hear law cases. They would collect taxes and they would make legal rulings on important cases. He also was the king who introduced the jury system in England, having a jury of your peers, 12 of your peers, to determine guilt or innocence. When you put all of the decisions of those traveling judges together, you actually make up an encyclopedia of laws for the people of England, and it's called common law. So you may have heard of common law. Um, Henry died, and several of his sons took charge of the country because very few of them had any kids. Uh, one of them, Richard the Lionhearted, when he died, his younger brother John had already been acting as king for a while. Because if you remember, why is Richard the Lionhearted famous? Because he went on crusade. And if he's gone to the Middle East fighting against Saladin and trying to reconquer the Holy Land and Jerusalem, who's running the country for him? Well, his younger brother John was running the government while Richard the Lionhearted, or Coeur de Lyon, Richard Coeur de Lyon, was off fighting the Crusades. And John gets a bad reputation for collecting too much in taxes. The reason that he had to collect all those taxes was to pay for his older brother's war, right, fighting the Crusades. But John is actually the villain, along with his nobleman, his vassal, the Sheriff of Nottingham. He's the villain in the Robin Hood stories. Robin Hood is against bad King John because John is collecting too much in taxes from the poor to pay for those crusades. So Robin Hood directly tied to the story of King John. John became king and he had that reputation for being money grubbing, for trying to collect too much in taxes. Interestingly, when Richard the Lionhearted was captured on crusade, uh, he, he was captured for a period of time the English had to pay to ransom him. And the money that they paid was equal to several years worth of the complete collection of money that England was worth. And so, yeah, John had to, had to have people pay a lot in taxes. So he lost a lot of battles against the French, and so he lost all English territory that was left over in northern France. Um, he lost the support of the church. John is not having a good time as king. His nobles rebelled against him in the year 1215. They forced him in a tent in the middle of a big meadow called Runnymede Field. 
they forced him to sign a document that would guarantee that the nobles wouldn't have to pay unreasonable taxes, wouldn't have to be arrested without a warrant, wouldn't have to be put on trial uh, or, or convicted without a trial. So this document about fair taxes, the right to a fair trial, the church having a right not to be interfered with with the government, was called the Magna Carta. A carta is a charter, and magna is Latin for big. So the Magna Carta. Now, I actually do want to take a moment to digress here from our history lecture to talk about a little bit of Latin. I don't know if you have older brothers or sisters, or if you're not one of my students and instead you're a college graduate who's visiting my lectures, but you can have honors. You can graduate with honors from college. And with honors in Latin means cum laude. So if you hear of someone graduating cum laude, it means with honors. If someone graduates higher than just on the honor roll, but on the high honor roll, then that's called magna cum laude, with great honors. And then if you graduate at the very tip top of your class, one of the very few people way up there with almost a perfect average or a perfect average, then it's, um, how, how about a mountain? Have any of you ever climbed a mountain? What's the very tip top of a mountain called, right? Up here, it's the summit, and that's a Latin term. And so if you graduate with the highest honors, the very tip top of the mountain, then you graduate summa, just like the word summit, summa cum laude. So there you go. Summa cum laude, magna cum laude, and then just cum laude from the top down. All Latin terms. Uh, Charlemagne, M-A-G-N-E, Charles the Great. Okay. That's your Latin lesson for the day. Eighty years after the Magna Carta was signed, another king of England, this guy Edward I, decided that he needed cash to try to fight a war against his enemies because Scotland to the north, Wales to the west, and France to the south across the water were all attacking England. In 1295, Edward I had to call all the nobles and the church and even middle-class people who lived in towns and cities who had enough money, and he had to call them together to ask them to charge new taxes for him. The common people, those who were not nobles or church officials, were called the commoners, and they had their own spot, the House of Commons. The church officials and the nobles gathered together in a place called the House of Lords. So you have two groups, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and they're still in existence today in the English government. Together, when you put together the House of Commons and the House of Lords, it's called Parliament, from a French word meaning to speak. So they get their say in Parliament. At first, the kings used Parliament as just a way to limit the power of the biggest lords, so that the smallest lords and the lower class people could all gang up on the big lords who might threaten the king too much. But over time, Parliament decided to unite together to try to limit the unlimited authority of the medieval kings. Now let's move over to France. After a period without strong kings, the 47 different territories that were feudally run by dukes or tiny kings were uh, united in a country called France. Around the year 990, they had one king, Hugh Capet, C-A-P-E-T. Over the next 300 years, Hugh Capet's family, the Capetian dynasty, C-A-P-E-T, just like his name, the Capetian dynasty, got stronger. One example of a king of France who got stronger of the Capetian dynasty was Philip II, also known as Philip Augustus. Augustus, of course, meaning the great, right? He increased the size of France's army. He beat King John. Remember bad King John of England? He beat him and took French territory away from the English, tripled the size of the official country of France. He also tried to centralize power away from his nobles into his own hands. 
and weaken the power of those nobles. His grandson is Louis IX. He is a super famous king of France because after his death, he had done so much to help Christianity that the popes made him a saint, Saint Louis. And you've probably heard of a city in the U.S. that's named for him. He ran the country in the mid-1200s. He created a better legal system for France. He was made a saint. There's the U.S. city named for him. Incidentally, one of the things that made him a saint isn't something you or I would think was all that nice, really. He, uh, there was this group in France called the Cathars, and they worshipped uh, a different kind of Christianity. Uh, I think whereas most Christians believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these people said that God really is just one and there's no Trinity. And so uh, the Pope wasn't cool with these people, and the King of France decided not to be cool with these people, so he led an invasion of their land in southern France and slaughtered them all, even though they were Christian. So that's one of the big reasons he became a saint. Around the 1300s, the early 1300s, there was a guy named Philip IV who ran France. He fought against the Pope in order to try to get more control of his country. He called together the first Parliament of France they call their parliament the Estates General, the Estates General. The first estate, there's three different groups. The first estate is, well, who comes first? God. And so the officials of the church are the first estate. And then we have the second estate, those who come second, the nobles. And then the third estate is the commoners. Unlike the parliament in England, the Estates General really never got much power. They were not allowed to meet very often. They became like, not very powerful. The kings were strong and independent without the nobles. England and France, with their legal systems, their documents about civil rights, and their legislatures, did become the most forward-thinking and free places in Western Europe and Central Europe during this time period. Uh, interesting little thing about Philip IV of France, he had borrowed a lot of money from a group of crusaders who had a ton of castles all across Europe and the Middle East to protect pilgrims who wanted to travel to the Middle East to go to the Holy Land, called the Knights Templars. You may have heard of them. Uh, Modern-day Freemasons claim to be descendants of the old Knights Templars. Well, Philip IV of France had borrowed a lot of money from them and he didn't want to have to pay it back. And so uh, he had control over the Pope at this point in history, and he told the Pope to outlaw the Knights Templars. And even though the leader of the Knights Templars, a man named Jacques de Molay, was friendly with the Pope and was working for the church, um, the Pope agreed to shut down the Knights Templars, and Philip IV of France kept all of their money that he could get a hold of and put the leaders on trial and burned them at the stake. The leader of the Knights Templars and a couple of his closest followers were burned at the stake in Paris in March 1314. And uh, unfortunately, the leader of that group, Jacques de Molay, put a curse on both the Pope and King Philip of France, saying that they would both be dead in a year. And lo and behold, they both were. More next time.